And the Buddha here says, resting one's awareness on body, knowing it as body, is basically cutting all the little labels that we've attached on everything. <laughs> and just seeing it for what it is, not adding on to it. And this in itself is extremely grounding in the present moment, here and now, and very peaceful. I'm leaving home for the coastline Someplace under the sun I feel my heart for the first time Forgiveness seems to not really be part of, of the Buddha's teaching sometimes because it's not the practice of forgiveness that I've been giving some people uh, that we can't seem to find like an actual discourse or whatever it is uh, even though it's very obvious in the monastic uh, way of life we always ask for forgiveness and all these things when we do offenses actually yet I find that this is also a place where we can find it in the four resting places of awareness because the Buddha didn't go into great details about the fluff of experience. <laughs> he didn't go into the minute details of all the feelings that we can experience. He just kind of grouped them and said, feel that in your body and how does that feel? And that's awareness of body. That's a Satipatthana. And this is where we go for understanding how these states hurt ourselves and when we're present with them we can actually let them go and this is really what that forgiveness is when we say stay with the feeling don't uh, don't try to ignore it don't try to push it away when it arises let it be seen and when we take care of awareness awareness takes care of us because when we see something that is hurtful here and now and we don't actually try to push it away or lock it down we're actually allowing it to process and there is a kind of a natural reaction in the mind when we do that is to actually move away from the hurt so Either we will shut it off or either we will allow it to come out and away. So that's the wise way, is to use awareness of the body and sensations and mind and principles of Dhamma to see this process happening. So yesterday we talked a little bit about the six senses, which is a little bit of an introduction to the Satipatthanas and this is a big this is a big topic I'm tackling the beast tonight <laughs> we are tackling the beast but um, because this sutta is a very long sutta I have only selected very short glimpses of it so that we can go to the essence of each of them and understand their purpose and why we uh, want to understand in that way so the, fir the four um, resting places of awareness the four foundations of mindfulness that's the way it's usually called the four satipatthanas are usually understood as what spoke of the path seventh is that seven yes <laughs> the seventh spoke of the patch, path which would be it starts with right 
<laughs> right mindfulness maybe yes samasati so when the buddha describes what samasati is he says the four resting places of awareness And I'll explain a little bit further why I call them. I chose to call them like that instead of the foundations uh, or the establishments, which is another way that Goenka would call them, for example. And this, um, this is, I like to see it as, this is where we ground ourselves in the Dhamma, in here and now, in presence of mind. I like to call this wise presence basically and this uh, in this discourse the Buddha opens quite strongly with a quite um, um, direct uh, stanza and he says this is the one-way path monks for the inner cleansing of beings for the soothing of sorrow and sadness, for the fading away of hurt and anxiety, for the arising of true understanding, for the realization of Nibbana, that is the four resting places of awareness. So I would say that's a pretty strong statement to start with. Uh, sounds like that's all we need to know. <laughs> But this is also directing us towards understanding things properly. So slowly, it's all a matter of perspectives, changing our perspective and turning it into a wholesome one. Here, uh, so basically he says, what for? Here monks, one meditates, resting one's awareness on body, knowing it as body, intent, fully conscious and present. Letting go of tensions and distractions. Now, in Pali, this is Vinaya Loke Abhija Domanasam, which translates more or less like letting go of likes and dislikes about all of our sensory experience, basically, the world. I, as I said yesterday, what is the world for the Buddha? It's the six senses. So here we see the bridge we started talking about yesterday. Resting one's awareness on sensations, knowing them as only sensations, intent, fully conscious, and present, letting go of tensions and distractions, resting one's awareness on mind, knowing it as only mind, intent, fully conscious, and present, letting go of tensions and distractions. Resting one's awareness on principles of Dhamma. Knowing them as principles of Dhamma. Intent, fully conscious and present. Letting go of tensions and distractions. So why do you think he says it in that way? Basically, knowing body as body. What does he mean? I mean, it sounds, sounds pretty flat, <laughs> but being conscious of the body, yes, aware of the body, yes. Yes, 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 also. And if we relate to yesterday, yesterday night's discourse, then what happens when, because, for example, body is also uh, what is the base for the six senses. So here we go from our talk yesterday into this one where we start with awareness of body, for example. An awareness of body is basically made up of five, these five senses that we experience. It is also the body, but it also the five senses. 
and what happens on the, at the five senses and, or anything in the body is that there is a contact. There is an impingement with, which produces a sensation, an experience. And then based upon that experience, there is thinking, projecting, perceptions, ideas, notions, opinions, views, preferences. And the Buddha here says, resting one's awareness on body, knowing it as body, is basically cutting all the little labels that we've attached on everything. <laughs> and just seeing it for what it is, not adding on to it. And this in itself is extremely grounding in the present moment, here and now, and very peaceful. Uh, so in what ways can we be aware of body? <laughs> if I imagine a pink flamingo, is that being aware of body? <laughs> no. Okay, good. You're still here. Bahidda. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's in the later formula that's coming. Yes. I'm just testing your sutta knowledge. No. <laughs> okay, so one of the first ways is yes. Yes. Yes, you can see your body so externally. Yes. Internal feedback. Uh -huh. like body positions. Uh huh. Yes. Body positions. Yes. Very good. That's that's exactly what I'm what I'm looking for because this is basically what's what's coming also. And so here we have. The Buddha starts with one of the most uh, common meditation instructions, uh, which is usually understood as related to the breath, but it doesn't have much to do with the breath. It ha actually has a lot more to do with the body. <laughs> so, uh, and this is a discourse that was delivered to more advanced practitioners. So we have to understand the right context for this. He's not going to explain the whole Dhamma before he, he just launches into that discourse. They already know the Dhamma. So how the six R's work, basically right effort, how to uplift the mind into collectedness, how to let go of uh, uh, unwholesome states of mind, all of that, all of that, these people already know that and you already know that too. So we don't have to explain that again. But here he goes saying, how does one meditate resting awareness on the body, knowing it as body? Then one sits down and starts meditating. One knows a long breath as a long breath. One knows a short breath as a short breath. Basically, in, in a f the further practice, the mind is already pretty well uh, settled into release. And so the first thing that it just knows is just breath and how, how long it can be and how short it can be. And so that's not really a meditation instruction. It's just basically seeing things for what it is. That's not uh, more complicated than that. One trains to experience the body breathing in and out. One trains to calm the tensions in the body breathing in and out. So here, what, what part of the six R's would that be? <laughs> relax, yeah, release, relax. So in this uh, discourse tonight, we will see also another perspective where we can actually find the six R's. It's just said in a different way, a little bit. Just as a skilled wood turner carving a long taper on his lathe knows I am carving a long taper. Carving a short taper on his lathe, one knows one is carving a short taper. 
for those of you who are woodworkers and know what a lathe is. <laughs> Thus one meditates, aware of one's own body. One knows it to be simply body. Aware of the body outside, one knows it to be simply body. Of, aware of one's own body or body outside, one knows it all to be just body. Aware of the arising nature of body and aware of the passing nature of body. Aware of the arising and passing nature of body. And by simply knowing, there is body. Awareness progressively settles. In this way, one meditates knowing for oneself, present to oneself, independent, not latching on to anything. This is how one meditates, resting one's awareness on the body, knowing it as body. So who thinks that's a little chewy? <laughs> I think. <laughs> but here, basically, we open up with this general awareness of the body and when every time you are feeling tension in your body and releasing and relaxing that tension you're practicing this you're practicing awareness of the body there's no choice more and more you will be just continually aware of body that's the only thing that's left when you're doing things when you're walking around when uh, doing uh, cooking, eating, uh, when mind doesn't have distractions and doesn't think, it's just aware of, of this thing we call the body. So it's basically resting on this. Now it's talking about daily activities and postures of the body, like Venerable was saying, uh, and it all uses the same sequence it all uses the same uh, phrases that that we just saw and so in in what ways can we be aware of sensations or our felt experiences yes attending to the feelings beneath The thoughts. So the feelings associated with thoughts and stories. Uh -huh. feeling body. Yes. Yes. Just just feeling. Just feeling dissociated from thoughts. Yes. Yes. Very good. Well basically we talked about it yesterday when uh, where sensations arise, experiences arise, and then Basically, whatever could be built upon that is released and relaxed, 6 R. And now we are aware of sensations as just as they, as they are. And just so we can understand, we put a lot of emphasis on dependent origination in this teaching, which is usually understood as these 12 links, which I'll be talking a little bit later about. Um, but the four resting places of awareness our dependent origination cleaned up from craving and ignorance. Basically, that's what the four foundations of mindfulness are. It's dependent origination, but without the dark side. <laughs> so that's always a beautiful recollection where, huh, well, that's actually what happens when there's no craving, when there's no ignorance. That's what, that's what happens. How does one meditate resting one's awareness on sensations, knowing them as only sensations? Here, experiencing a pleasant sensation, one knows, I am experiencing a pleasant sensation. Experiencing an unpleasant sensation, one knows, I am experiencing an unpleasant sensation. What would be the usual uh, dialogue, inner dialogue, that goes on here when you stub your toe on on a brick or something. It's like, 
<laughs> Something like that. <laughs> oh, I hate it when that happens. Or, oh, I hate you. Or all of these nasty things that goes on into our mind. But here, more and more, when, when the mind gets purified of all these concepts and ideas and likes and dislikes, then we just stub our toes and there's an unpleasant sensation arising and it's seen for what it is and it's like, oh, there is this sharp tingling and throbbing sensation in my big toe, <laughs> which is not very pleasant. Hmm. And then one just looks at it, feels it, without adding anything. See, that's, that's, life is so much better without commentaries. <laughs> we can even, because the mind is very wholesome, we've practiced forgiveness a lot, we've practiced compassion and loving kindness. The, usually, the usual tendency of the mind then will actually be to send loving kindness to the hurt, to send forgiveness, to be, oh, I forgive you, body, for hurting right now. Or, oh, poor you, I feel compassion for you, toe. And it becomes this very calm and serene experience. And more and more we can receive our experience and accept and process it and allow it to purify itself. Experiencing a pleasant physical sensation, one knows I am experiencing a pleasant physical sensation. Experiencing a pleasant mental sensation, one knows I am experiencing a pleasant mental sensation. Experiencing an unpleasant physical sensation, one knows I am experiencing an unpleasant physical sensation. Experiencing an unpleasant mental sensation, one knows I am experiencing an unpleasant mental sensation. The more we see the mechanism, then the, the less we take it personal. And then, of course, the more we stay detached from involving ourselves in it. Thus, one meditates aware of one's own sensations or experiences One knows them to be simply sensations. Aware of sensations outside, one knows them to be simply sensations. Aware of one's own sensations and sensations outside, one knows them all to be just sensations. So whatever in the realms of sensations you can feel, these are all just sensations. And this is starting to sound like a meditation instruction that I give a lot when people start to go to deeper levels of meditation. And for example, in, in the plane of nothingness, in the clear mind, in neither perception or non-perception, things arise, perceptions arise, sensations arise, and then they pass away. And this is the meditation instructions. We just see them for what they are. They are perceptions, they arose through causes and conditions, and then they pass away. And there's nothing to do about them. It's actually to remain, uh, remain detached, remain releasing and relaxing, staying out of it, not engaging. Aware of the arising nature of sensations, aware of the passing nature of sensations, aware of the arising and passing nature of sensations. And by simply knowing there are sensations, awareness progressively settles. See, when we don't actually add anything upon our experience, mind just starts to detach naturally. And some, some of you here have experienced that uh, doing forgiveness meditation uh, in the past few days where only to be aware of these sensations that come up and allowing them to surface we're not trying to fix the mind heart like Doug says only to be aware of it is sufficient and to remain there and to continue releasing and relaxing and the block the chunk just moves out and away basically 
That's all that needs to be done, actually. Because the mind always wants to fix things. It always wants to get involved. It wants, it wants the formula. <laughs> it wants to get in there and try to make it right. But actually, it's about just allowing that to happen. Yes. Yes. If you can. <laughs> if, yes. No, yeah. Yeah, doing forgiveness is a little bit different. So the question was, uh, if you say you release and relax while doing forgiveness, do you have to re-smile? Well, the thing is, if you can, good. Sometimes you will be able, but if you can't, don't try to force it. Uh, mind, mind will know how to untangle itself as you release and relax. If, if you feel that it's um, really forced, then just, that's okay. So the, the re-smile step is also kind of internal. So it's like checking to make sure that your mind is uplifted. Even if the outer physical smile isn't there, there can be kind of this returning to an uplifted mind. Part of that yeah, if possible, I a lot of the time I feel like some things will be quite coarse, and when they move through, they move through. It's like you might not be wanting to smile, and when it comes up, I mean, you, you don't want to ask them to smile. <laughs> like that would be a big mistake, but. But sometimes it does work. Um, and that's actually why I stopped. Uh, I removed the, he abused me, he, uh, he beat me, he whatever. Uh, one who harbors such thoughts does not, uh, anger is not appeased. Well, actually that's a pretty big trigger <laughs> for, for people who have that trauma. So. Because usually we, we used to recite that Dhammapada line every morning. So we've had some bad experiences with that. <laughs> so it's out of the retreats now. Anyhow, so if you can, smile. Great. That's, that's why it's kind of, it really depends on the heaviness of what's going on. So if, um, If people are slowly starting to kind of move back out and towards metta, because what will often happen is that when you re forgive a big chunk, then it, it kind of like leaves you a bit like hollowed out because it's it's rough, you know, it's not it's not easy. So it's like all that emotional block just comes out, and it's like feeling okay, like now that's a new beginning kind of thing so it kind of starts to fill in again with wholesomeness and and then the heart will be a little lighter and then mind will usually feel like at some point it 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 just feels metta because it feels uplifted that wow like such a huge chunk just came out of my chest basically and now the mind is uplifted okay in this way, one meditates knowing for oneself, present to oneself, independent, not latching on to anything. This is how one meditates, resting one's awareness on sensations, knowing them as sensations. And so now moving to the next one, awareness of mind. So how do you think we can be aware of mind? What does that mean, awareness of mind? <laughs> Contents, of the mind. Contents of the mind, yes, yes. Going back to awareness itself. Going back to awareness itself, yes. Aware that one is aware. Yes, yes. That sounds very Advaita. 
Uh -huh. But seeing from uh, outside of you. Like yes, you. seeing from outside of you, from a different perspective. Yeah, like being detached. I think that's kind of like the essence behind the Satipatthana is just to remaining detached from, from all of this. And I like the um, reference that the Buddha is always giving about impermanence, knowing the arising, knowing the passing, knowing the arising and passing. Because when we're not latching on, all we're seeing is just, it's just passing. It's just arising and passing away, arising and passing. It's when we latch on to something that it stays and then it gets bigger. But when we practice like that, it's actually an advanced release and relax practice, basically. How does one meditate resting one's awareness on mind, knowing it as mind? And so this is another really interesting one. Here one understands when mind is wanting, mind is wanting. When mind is free from desires, one understands mind is free from desires. When mind is angry, one understands mind is angry. When mind is free from anger, one understands mind is free from anger. So here, we're not talking about right effort. We're just talking about seeing things for what they are. Um, we're not trying to fix it at this point. We're only trying to first see it. First see it for what it is. And if there is anger in the mind, it's okay. If we get angry because we're angry, then it's double whammy. So it's not worth it. But if we just see it, oh, there's anger in the mind. Well, that's the first step. And it's okay. There's going to be things. There's going to be distractions. There's going to be defilements. And the first step is to see it for what it is. When mind is deluded, one understands mind is deluded. What would that be? <laughs> confusion. Yes, yes. Confusion. Yes, that's. Yes, yes, unable to process reality. <laughs> Not seeing the true nature of things. Yes, when the mind is angry, is it seeing the true nature of things? Ah, uh, yes, if it sees anger, yes, <laughs> good, yeah, oh, venerable, this is catching up, <laughs> very good. When mind is undiluted, one understands mind is undiluted. When mind is constricted, one understands mind is constricted. What would that be? Well, there's two ways of, of translating that word, is either collected or constricted. So there's, there's a few different interpretations. Because the next one is, when mind is scattered, one understands mind is scattered. So you could have like collected and scattered, or constricted and scattered. Since they're kind of opposites from the beginning, uh, it's probably collected. So, not losing your mind when collectedness isn't there. Uh, it's just not there. And it's okay. And we just continue. We just continue the practice. And it, at some point, mind, as it will start to really rest into reality for what it is, collectedness will come back. The mind will settle. When mind is expansive, one understands mind is expansive. When mind is unexpansive, one understands mind is unexpansive. When mind is, when mind has more to do, one understands mind has more to do. When mind has no more to do, one understands mind has no more to do. What would be the expansive and unexpansive? <laughs> supreme. supreme supreme yes is it, uh, is it like 
Aha, Mahagata. Yes, I think so. Yes, yeah, yes, the spank expansive mind. Rupa jhanas and Arupa jhanas. We've got some real scholars in the house. <laughs> really good. <laughs> and maybe Brahma viharas also expansive, right? It's this kind of. But jhanas also are the big, an uh, increasingly expansive mind. When the mind is collected, one understands mind is collected. When mind is agitated, one understands mind is agitated. When the mind is liberated, one understands mind is liberated. Interesting. When mind is not liberated, one understands <laughs> mind is not liberated. That's a good one. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> Um, thus one meditates, aware of one's own mind. One knows it to simply be mind. Aware of a mind outside. Hmm. One knows it to simply be mind. Aware of one's own mind and a mind outside, one knows it all to be just mind. So whatever is arising in mind, whatever mind is doing, whatever, if you can actually understand other minds with your mind, and <laughs> even if you're there, you have to train still to just see it all as just mind. It's just mind, here and outside. Aware of the arising nature of the mind, aware of the passing nature of the mind, aware of the arising and passing nature of the mind. And by simply knowing there is mind, awareness progressively settles. In this way, one meditates, knowing for oneself, present to oneself, independent, not latching on to anything. So does that sound familiar to some of you today? I said, don't try to get involved with what you're experiencing. Let it come up, let it come out. And just allow the process to run through. And you will see at some point it will settle on its own as we remain detached. This is how one meditates, resting one's awareness on the mind knowing it as mind. Now, awareness of Dhamma principles, Dhamma Nusati. No. Huh? Dhamma Nupassana, yes. Yes, Dhamma Nusati is another thing. <laughs> Very good, that was a test, test question. <laughs> yes, venerable is. Yeah, I should give the microphone and. <laughs> yes, very good. So, in what ways, what does it mean? Awareness of natural principles or Dhamma principles or Dhamma as Dhamma. In what ways can we know this? In what shape or form does that manifest? Six sense process, yes, that's one of them, yes, very good. The Four Noble Truths, the Five Hindrances, the Seven Supports of Awakening or Factors of Enlightenment. Uh, you're going to have to work because he's selling all of them. <laughs> Quick, before he finishes. Okay, so let's just dive in. How does one meditate resting one's awareness on Dhamma principles or just knowing, knowing them to be Dhamma principles? Here one rests awareness on Dhamma principles, knowing them as only Dhamma principles regarding the five hindrances. So basically, he just goes through the elaboration of what that all means when there is 
craving in the mind, to know there is craving in the mind, when, to know how to let it go, to know how to cultivate the path, basically. And one of the misunderstandings that's happening nowadays with the Satipatthanas is that people take this to be the actual practice, like if the Satipatthanas were right effort, but they're not. Satipatthanas are, is like neutral. It's the way that we understand things, the way that we start to slowly understand reality more and more and more and more. But they're not right effort. They're not, they're not the verb of the path. They're not the action of the path. And so in a lot of, um, in a lot of uh, teachings that I've encountered anyways on my own path, the general tendency is to believe that the Satipatthana Sutta is basically the all in all, the holy grail of meditation instructions. Whereas it's actually just instructing us on wise awareness, basically. And how we're going to perceive reality or how we should train to perceive reality more and more. But it's not talking about wholesome mental development. And that's the way we get there. That's the way that we actually get to wise awareness, wise presence of mind. So we don't want to confuse the, the cow for the butter or, you know, uh, the action verb of the path for uh, the grammar. <laughs> so that's what it is. Yes. Yes, they are, they are in some way inseparable, yes. But when, you, when we put too much emphasis on, on just knowing body as body, for example, we don't understand how to let go of unwholesome states. Of, uh, I mean, the tendency is not to follow, well, first of all, <laughs> the tendency is not to really follow what the Buddha says in the suttas. It's actually to... Um, We've, we've moved like off track so, so kind of far. Um, you know, we're not actually being aware of the whole body and, and calming the, the sankharas in the body. I mean, that's not what I was being taught when I was practicing these kinds of meditation. It was actually, it was quite different. <laughs> so there was no relaxing. There was no pasambayam. There was no, uh, there was not that relaxed step which is absolutely crucial. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it's not just views, and it's like a lot of spiritual teachings right now, they say like it's all about awareness. Yes. But, uh, so if you have like a negative state in the mind, and you're aware of it, but you're not like letting it go, then mm -hmm. you're just like noting it, or just yeah. letting it stay there. The noting, the continual noting, there's no letting go when you're noting. And actually, you know, I, unfortunately, I've seen these practices being pushed too far and throw people off the edge of mental sanity. So, uh, and that happens quite often uh, in, in, the, in that, these kinds of practices because, I mean, you're cultivating OCD, basically. <laughs> it's like you're noting everything all the time. I mean, you're just like, a lot of people actually go crazy, unfortunately. There were, there's actually uh, Ruth, Ruth Dennison had this, uh, this center for women in Joshua Tree uh, to rehabilitate people who had gone through these practices and were completely cut off from their bodies. And they were completely uh, very, uh, they were in a pretty difficult state. And she would make them work like in the yard and like, like, mindful work but still you know like getting back into their bodies because they had been completely propulsed in the mental realms in in not the right way <laughs> not not a good way so uh it's just basically training the mind to obsess about everything uh and not to actually let go the first thing that really struck me when i first came upon bhante vimalaramsi's teaching was that he was explaining right effort. And that's like bottom ground. Uh, the, f the first thing I noticed was like, oh, so finally, 
like that's what that means and there's an actual practice you know, it's not just about awareness, like you're saying, and that's a really common, nowadays, uh, common. And it's not that these practices don't lead anywhere. It's just that, first, some of them you have to be careful about because there's so many kinds of practices out there. You can't just say, generalize for everything. But um, some of them can lead to quite beautiful places but then you're still attached to awareness and that's not Nibbana. So it doesn't punch through. Anyhow, let's, uh, <laughs> let's move along. So the, the five uh, aggregates, the five, did, did we say that? The five aggregates? No, that's, that's one we missed. So basically to, to see Basically, all that means with all of these names and complicated terms uh, for, for, for us to understand tonight is that basically whenever things arise, we understand them to be basically mechanism or uh, the way that the Dhamma operates. When there is a hindrance arising, you don't think, oh, this is me, this is who I am. Like, I'm angry at this person and then starting to believe the storyline when anger arises, you just know, oh, this is anger. Not a story. The story doesn't matter. The anger is just anger. And then when we see that like that, then we, we're, seeing, we're starting to see it the right way. It's impersonal. And then when we use, for example, the seven supports of awakening uh, with... Uh, with awareness and then investigation of states, right effort, the six R's, doing that continuously, then joy arises. With that joy, the body and the mind calms down. When the body and the mind calm down, one experiences happiness or ease. When one experiences happiness, the mind gets collected. This is not personal. Everybody's mind works in the same way, in that sense. And that's why the Buddha is a genius, because he just figured, he just figured that out. And I can tell you that it's, it's the same for everybody. And so it's not a personal thing. People say, oh, you're attached to the joy. No, joy actually keeps things light. You stop believing your mind with, when it comes with stories, when it starts to get serious. When the mind gets serious, that's when you have attachments. That's when you, the mind gets sullen. That's when the mind gets, starts to identify. The serious mind is the identifying mind. And it takes everything personal and makes a big deal out of everything. But when you're happy, it's light. It's easy. It's selfless. Anatta. Yes. Yes. But on the, on the other hand, uh, things like relaxing, the voluntary thing, um, also can happen like involuntary things, mm -hmm. just like naturally, mm -hmm. through doing the things that lead to it. Yes. Like bringing joyfulness. Yes. Um, so when you talk about how to like a misunderstanding is to just focus everything on being mindful. Yes. Uh, you mean like the like putting too much energy and emphasis on it? Because it's not like you don't want to be mindful. And you do have to use some intention for it. Yes. Is it like a greater intention? Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly where the, the, I think, why the Buddha said, Samma Sati. So there is, there is mindfulness, but there's also right mindfulness. So it's not any kind of mindfulness. It's not any kind of samadhi. It's not any kind of uh, effort. 
So the, that's why he, he says he uses the word Samma. I personally prefer to translate it as wise, but that's my own uh, perception of it. I think the flavor comes across a little bit better. But when, when there is that wise awareness, wise awareness is about the four Satipatthana, seeing things for what they are. And it's not necessarily like paying attention. We have to understand wise awareness comes from right effort. Wise practice, basically. So when we let go, release, and relax, bring up a smile, stay with the love, we start to see things in an untainted way. And that is wise awareness. I usually say that wise awareness is a byproduct of wise practice, basically. So as you practice properly, you do the six R's, stay with the wholesome object, then wise awareness just automatically grows. Yeah, that's, that's wise awareness. Awareness alone is not what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the name of a book, right? Yeah, Utejaniya. Yeah. Awareness alone is not enough. Right? Mindfulness really is this, the sutta that I'm talking about tonight. So, but the moment you start to, you buy into the story and you really take things personal and you identify with the experience uh, deeply, deeply, like you're, you're just like basically, um, you're submerged in it. You don't see anything but that and its identity and me, it's happening to me and all of that, then you, you really s deep down in it kind of thing. So that's not, that's not wise awareness. But if you were to start l looking at that position and seeing, oh, I'm really taking that personally. Oh, my mind is really like taking this story personal and then now this is the birth of right uh, right mindfulness or wise awareness mm -hmm. and usually that would happen when you six hours yes so when you practice right effort you six are you six are and then because you see the tension and then you six are and you say oh right yeah i was i was really kind of taking so see Wise awareness only happens also when you six R, when you release and relax. Yes. Uh, yeah. It seems like that ability to detach and um, let go and kind of have a relaxed awareness um, is what would differentiate a lot between the people who crack in meditation practice versus the people who successfully So it might not be so much like the, because not everyone in every single meditation practice practice. Like there are people who do well and do both well the shapes and shapes. Um, but would it be that, that aspect of relaxing that is not explicitly taught, that should be kind of emphasizing? Yeah, definitely. definitely. If there's one thing that is major that is missing right now in the Buddha's way that it's under the Buddha's teaching, the way it's understood is the relaxed step, definitely. And the importance of joy. Not as like unworldly raptures that arises after, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, not Kanaka Samadhi, but uh, Upachara Samadhi, and then like, you know, like just you know joy <laughs> and cultivating it for a while these two things are like uh, ex extremely essential and that's why i every retreat um, we read the natural collectiveness sequence because that's so so essential so we have this wise awareness we see things for what they are we don't take them personal we don't label them we don't buy into the story and in another discourse, the Buddha really ex explains how to use this wise awareness, the four satipatthanas, 
body as body, sensations as sensations, mind as mind, and Dhamma principles as Dhamma principles, as a way to start to fulfill the seven supports of awakening. And at that moment, it becomes active. At that moment, it starts to actually become part of right effort, of wise practice. And so he says, when one meditates, resting one's awareness on the body, knowing it as body, intent, fully conscious and present, letting go of tensions and distractions. One is not carried away by distractions. And there comes to be awareness. When one is not carried away and there comes to be awareness, at that time the support of awakening of awareness becomes manifest. It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. Meditating with this awareness, one seeks wholesome states and discards unwholesome ones and completely understands one's mental states that arise using discernment, that is Dhamma Vichaya. Whenever one is meditating with this awareness, using right effort, at that time the support of awakening of discernment, Dhamma Vichaya, is becomes manifest it is being developed and it gradually matures by development so this is what we do with wise awareness so it doesn't just stop there <laughs> we do something whenever there is <laughs> there's work to be done <laughs> for those of you who know who, who i'm referring to Whenever there is seeking wholesome states and discarding unwholesome ones and completely understanding one's mental states that arise using discernment continually, enthusiastically, with devotion, at that time the support of awakening of devotion, effort, wiriya becomes manifest. It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. With this inspired practice, spiritual joy arises, niramisa. Whenever spiritual joy arises because of inspired practice, at that time the support of awakening of joy becomes manifest. It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. With this spiritual joy, the body becomes calm and the mind calms down. Whenever the body calms down and the mind calms down because of spiritual joy, the support of awakening of calm, fasadi, becomes manifest. It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. With this calmness of body, the, the happy mind becomes unified. Sukino Chittang Samadhyati. Whenever the happy mind becomes unified by way of bodily calm, at that time the support of awakening of mental collectedness, Samadhi, becomes manifest. It is being developed and it gradually matures by development. With this calm, collected mind, one steadily attends with discernment. Whenever one steadily attends with discernment by way of calm collectedness of mind, at that time the support of awakening of mental steadiness, upekka. This is how I translate upekka, because upekka also means upa ishka, which is like on looking, steadiness of awareness. Becomes manifest and it is developed, being developed. It gradually matures by development. So now we have a full circle. We began this retreat talking about right effort, the six R's, the Brahma Viharas, bringing up loving kindness. Now we've started to understand a little bit the workings of the mind yesterday, a little bit with the six senses, how it arises, papancha. And then today, wise awareness and how it ties in to itself with right effort, with the seven supports of awakening. The six R's is this practice. At the beginning, we also had the instruction to calm the body, to be aware of the body, 
If you're practicing forgiveness, you have coarse emotions arising, hurt, to be with it, not to try to change it, to relax, to welcome it, to be kind to yourself. And then using the seven supports of awakening to continue to grow this awareness that is liberated, that is Teflon awareness, non-stick awareness. Remain quiet, go into the stillness. And this is what you're doing here. You're coming on retreat. You're clearing off all of your other hobbies and uh, things that you like to do and distractions at the same time and coming into stillness. And this is where you see what is actually happening inside, the truth that is inside of you. And you can actually now, using this wonderful opportunity to align with your inner truth to an even deeper degree. And this grace is simply just welcoming the grace of the Dhamma, the grace of wholesome states and the grace of liberation in your life and carry that joy with you all the time. So on this, that's all for me tonight. Thank you. <laughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I'm leaving home for the coastline, someplace under the sun. I feel my heart for the first time. Cause now I'm moving on, yeah